Hello, my name is Danielle Vassilotti, and I am the coordinator for this Stop Flu Expo program. Today, a few of my colleagues and I will be presenting information on how to manage Stop Flu at School vaccination clinics. Let's begin with an overview of the clinic manager's role and responsibilities, and these can be broken up into three phases, pre-clinic, operations, and post-clinic. Before the clinic begins, the manager will need to check in staff, facilitate clinic setup, provide just-in-time training, and perform a clinic walkthrough to ensure the setup is complete and flow-through is efficient. During operations, the manager will manage staff and ensure program procedures and protocol are being followed. The manager will utilize the management of acute adverse reactions to vaccines and document all incidents. After operations have ended, the manager will oversee clinic breakdown and complete all necessary forms. Before we go more in depth with activities that occur during each phase, it is important to mention a significant change in program eligibility. <clears throat> Students in grades uh, kindergarten through eight at participating schools are still eligible but due to funding constraints, adults are, able, are not able to receive vaccines through this program. This includes school faculty and staff and clinic staff. So to repeat, school faculty and staff and clinic staff are not eligible for vaccination at the Stop Fluid School Clinic. Okay, so now I will begin to talk more in detail about the manager's pre-clinic duties. Check in at the office 60 minutes prior to clinic start time to meet with the school liaison and to check all supply boxes and vaccine coolers to ensure there are sufficient supplies and vaccine to conduct the clinic from start to finish. If any items are missing, use the telephone triage to contact the appropriate person at Doc D for Oahu staff or the district health office for the neighbor island staff. The clinic manager or vaccine group supervisor must check the vaccine cooler to ensure that the vaccine is cold but not frozen. Vaccines should not be in direct contact with the cold gel packs. The vaccine should have been packed with temperature monitor strips. Check the monitor strips to confirm that the vaccine has not been frozen or exposed to excessive heat. The warm temperature monitor strips are pictured here in the upper left-hand corner the strip reading should not equal or exceed the number three. The cold temperature monitor is pictured in the upper right-hand corner. The bubble should not be opaque, so the check mark should be visible. There is an example in the picture of what is okay and what is frozen. If either monitor indicates that the temperature has gotten too warm or too cold, contact the immunization branch immediately. Do not administer the vaccine. The clinic manager must look at the expected number of participating students found on the SFAS 204 form and that the quantity of vaccine is sufficient for the clinic. Also ensure that there is a sufficient quantity of lot number labels and that the lot number labels, and then the lot number on the labels matches the lot number for the vaccine. Because these are mass vaccination clinics, there will often be a need to pre-fill syringes. It is very important that the clinic manager and vaccine group supervisor supervise this activity to ensure that it is performed carefully and to ensure no wastage occurs. Draw or instruct vaccinator staff to draw a maximum of 10 doses per multi-dose vial. Open the syringe package as syringes are filled, but not before. Store pre-filled syringes appropriately in vaccine coolers until needed, with a maximum of 20 syringes inside each soft cooler. Do not leave vials or pre-filled syringes exposed to ambient room temperature and or light, as it could affect vaccine viability. There may be times when not all 10 doses are needed from a vial. The leftover vaccine is referred to as a partial vial. When this occurs, 
Indicate the number of drawn doses on the vial and on the box. Then place the vial back in the box and store appropriately in the cooler. The clinic manager is responsible for managing clinic staff. Ensure that everyone signs in on the 211 or 211B. Alicia will discuss these forms later in this presentation. School volunteers should sign in on the volunteer form. Please note that contracted staff are not to begin working until their designated start time, even if they arrive early. Ensure that all vaccinators read the standing orders and initial off on the 211B in that column. Assign identification codes to the vaccinators. These codes are listed on the 211B and will be used for documentation of vaccine administration. As needed, the clinic manager can assign personnel to act as supervisors of the registration station and line flow personnel, as well as vaccinators. The manager will often need to assign roles within groups. For example, assign registration staff to screen forms or control line flow or watch students in the observation area. If the observation area is in a separate room from the clinic, then there must be one RN stationed to that room with an extra emergency kit. The clinic manager will also need to assign vaccinators to administer either IIV, which is the flu shot, or LAIV, which is the flu nasal spray, and ensure all staff receive and review their job action sheets and provide standardized just-in-time training. Once just-in-time training has been conducted, staff must initial off on the 211 or 211B. Ensure that all staff understand their roles and duties. A school may have parent or school volunteers. These volunteers may not screen consent forms, but they may assist with line flow. They may assist trained clinic staff in the observation area, but they may not staff the observation area without an SFA as clinic staff member present. These volunteers must sign in on the volunteer form, not the 211 or 211V. The 211 and 211V are for trained clinic staff only. Advise clinic staff that any questions, issues, or adverse events should be reported, must be reported to the clinic manager. It is mandatory that all staff must receive just-in-time training. Clinic managers will receive standardized forms to use for this purpose. Pictured here is the just-in-time training document that includes reminders for the clinic manager and all registration staff. Pictured here is the just-in-time training document that includes reminders for vaccinators. I won't read through this as it will be provided to you at a later time. There must also be some on-site training for vaccinators. Demonstrate the use of the retractable syringe. Remind vaccinators to properly dispose of used syringes immediately following vaccination to reduce the risk of needle stick injuries. Remind vaccinators to wash hands or use hand sanitizer between each patient. If gloves are worn, they must be changed between patients. Gloves must be worn if the vaccinator has open lesions on their hand, or if the vaccinator is likely to come into contact with potentially infectious body fluids. Remind vaccinators that participants with a screening question marked yes should not be vaccinated, even if they have a doctor's note. For example, the parent answered yes to asthma or wheezing and brings a doctor's note saying the patient may receive LAIV, which is the nasal spray. Do not vaccinate this participant. Ensure that all vaccinators review the standing orders and are familiar with the emergency kit content and location. The clinic manager will look at the space provided by the school and determine the clinic flow plan and oversee the setup. IIV and LAIV stations should be distinct and separate to avoid administration errors. 
The observation area should be within the clinic and near the vaccination stations, within sight of the clinic manager. However, sometimes this isn't always possible. If the observation area is in a separate room, make sure to add one emergency kit and one RN to that observation area. The observation area must be large enough to allow vaccinees to be seated. All vaccinees must be seated in the observation area. The clinic manager must perform a clinic walkthrough before operations begin to check that flow will be efficient. Once the staff have been briefed and the clinic is set up, operations can begin. Ensure clinic starts and ends at the scheduled time. Record clinic times and the school ID number on the Stop Flu at School 204 form. The end time is when the clinic is completed. Communicate with the school liaison to escort students to and from the clinic. Please note that the liaison must bring the last group of students down 20 to 30 minutes before clinic end time to allow for vaccination and the 15 minute observation time. This is dependent on group size, room size, and number of vaccinators. The clinic manager will oversee all clinic operations, maintain a steady pace, identify bottlenecks, and make appropriate adjustments. Ensure safety for all participants and clinic staff. Clinic manager, the clinic manager will follow up on forms as needed. The cold chain must be maintained for vaccines at all times. Excessive light, heat, or cold exposure damages vaccine, resulting in loss of potency. Ensure that vaccine is stored in vaccine coolers or at the vaccination stations in soft-sided coolers with contents layered. The vaccine must always be packed in layers for insulation and to keep the appropriate temperature. This is true of the large holding coolers and also of the soft-sided tabletop coolers. The layers are as follows. Ice packs, also referred to as gel packs, on the bottom, then a barrier, such as bubble wrap, then the vaccine, more barrier, and then another layer of ice packs. Pack vaccines, including the partially used vials, inside the boxes on top of the, of the barrier so that the vaccine is not in direct contact with the ice packs. Ensure that the warm and cold temperature monitor strips are placed next to the vaccine and not in contact with the ice packs, or it will give it an accurate reading. Ensure proper disposal of all hazardous materials. All vaccinators must place used syringes in the sharps container immediately after administration. Hazardous materials should not be accessible to non-clinic personnel. The clinic manager will address apprehensive students before vaccination. If the student is still apprehensive or crying, have a secondary person such as the health aide, flow control staff, stay with the child during vaccination. Do not restrain a child for vaccine administration. If safety becomes an issue, do not vaccinate. The clinic manager is also responsible for responding to and managing adverse events. Address students with incomplete consent forms or potential contraindications. You may need to complete the bottom portion of the parent guardian notification half sheet. This form goes home with each student. If they are vaccinated, it is indicated. If they are not vaccinated, indicate the reason on the bottom half of the form. If the child is not vaccinated for the following reasons, please indicate that on the half sheet so that the parent is aware. This includes incomplete consent forms, such as any question being answered, um, being left blank, or if the parent or guardian's signature is missing, or the date of the signature is missing. It also includes contraindications to immunization, which would be indicated if any question from one through three were answered as yes on the flu shot form, or if any question from one to eight were answered as yes on the flu nasal spray form. Please note that question four has two parts, 
and both must be answered no. Complete the parent guardian notification form. If the student feels ill or has a fever, if the student refuses vaccination, or for any other reason that would cause the child not to get vaccinated. To complete the parent guardian notification form, record the student's name and date, indicate the reason the student did not receive the vaccine, retain the original copy of the student's consent form, but indicate the reason for not completing the vaccination at the bottom of the consent form, and then provide the parent guardian notification form to the student to take home to their parent. The clinic manager must ensure proper completion and collection of all consent forms. All vaccinations must be fully documented on the bottom of each consent form. No missing information, no missing lot number labels, and the ID code matches the vaccinator's assignment on the 211B. Gail will go over this in more detail later in this presentation. Remember, no lot, numbers, no lot number labels affixed if the person was not vaccinated. The clinic manager will oversee the management of any adverse event post-vaccination. Follow the standing orders for the management of acute adverse reactions to vaccines. Call 911 immediately for any serious adverse event. Notify the Department of Health Immunization Branch of any serious adverse event within two hours of occurrence. Once clinic has concluded, the clinic manager will supervise breakdown, staff checkout, and form completion. Ensure proper retrieval and packing of all hazardous waste products. There are additional SHARPS instructions. Oversee the packing of all remaining supplies. Ensure collection of all consent forms. Ensure the delivery of supplies to the Department of Health or designated location. Ensure the clinic site is returned to its original condition. All remaining vaccine should be returned in the same manner that it was received. Vaccine cooler contents should be layered in the same manner as was discussed earlier in the presentation. Ice packs, also referred to as gel packs, barrier, vaccine, barrier, ice packs. Ensure the vaccine and monitors are not in direct contact, contact with ice packs. Ensure the SHARPS containers are not filled beyond the maximum fill line. Close, lock, and tape all SHARPS containers, even if only partially filled. If transporting SHARPS containers in a non-leak proof box, line the box first with a large biohazard bag. Place the closed, locked, and taped sharps containers into the lined box. Tie off the ends of the biohazard bag, then secure the tie off with tape. Cover the box with the lid, secure the lid with tape, and affix the biohazard symbol labels to the box. Transport the boxes containing the sharps in an enclosed vehicle compartment like the trunk of a car, if possible, and ensure the biohazard symbol placard is displayed on the transport vehicle's dashboard. Okay, pictured here is a Stop Flu at School 204 form. Complete this form with summary figures, the clinic start and end time, and any relevant notes. The clinic manager's name and the date must also be included. Pictured here is one of the sign-in, sign-out sheets. Alicia will review these in more detail in a few minutes. Ensure that all staff have signed in and out, and that the clinic start and end time have been indicated, as well as the school name and ID number. Send the original 204, 211, 211B, and any volunteer sign-in forms to the immunization branch along with the consent forms, supplies, and vaccine. And lastly, notify the school liaison of the clinic's conclusion. Ensure staff sign out 
on the log in the school administration office. This concludes my segment of this presentation. Now, I will hand the presentation off to our program's safety officer, Dr. Marcy Nagal. In this section, we will review the school-located influenza vaccination program standing orders. All vaccinators must review, understand, and adhere to the Stop Fluid School Program standing orders for inactivated influenza vaccine, live attenuated intranasal influenza vaccine, and the protocol for the management of acute adverse reactions to vaccines. All personnel administering vaccines need to be prepared to recognize and respond immediately and appropriately if an adverse reaction should occur. Vaccinators and clinic managers must review the standing orders prior to working at a stop fluid school immunization clinic. When assessing persons with possible adverse reactions post-vaccination, follow basic first aid and initial assessment procedures. Check their vital signs, airway, breathing, including both their respiratory rate and air movement, and circulation, including pulse and blood pressure. Evaluate their level of consciousness and appearance. Are they alert? Do they look comfortable? Are they able to speak? Do they seem anxious? Persons that are anxious when receiving a vaccination may hyperventilate. Symptoms of hyperventilation include rapid breathing with good air movement, no wheezing or strider, the patient may appear anxious but not tired or pale, and they may complain of lightheadedness. To manage hyperventilation, make sure the airway is clear. Instruct the patient to sit or lie down and slow down their breathing. Have the patient breathe into a paper bag to correct the hyperventilation. Provide support and reassurance and monitor the patient until the episode subsides. Symptoms of lightheadedness include fright before the vaccination is given, complaints of feeling faint, dizzy, or tired. The patient may appear pale. They may be yawning. They have a good steady pulse and no respiratory distress. To manage lightheadedness, have the patient sit or lie down for vaccination. Have the patient lie flat or sit with their head between their knees for several minutes. Loosen any tight clothing and maintain an open airway. Check their vital signs, including pulse, respirations, and blood pressure. And apply cool, damp cloths to their face or neck. Symptoms of syncope or fainting may include extreme paleness, sweating, cold hands and feet, nausea, lightheadedness, dizziness, weakness, visual disturbances, their vital signs should be normal, the patient should be breathing normally, respirations may be shallow, but the patient should be in no respiratory distress, the pulse should be regular, and they may fall without loss of consciousness or they may lose consciousness. To manage fainting, have the patient lie flat or sit with their head between their knees for several minutes. Loosen any tight clothing and maintain an open airway. Check their vital signs, including pulse, blood pressure, and respirations, and apply cool, damp cloths to their face and neck. If the patient loses consciousness, examine them to determine if an injury is present before attempting to move the patient. Place the patient flat on his or her back with their feet elevated, and call 911 if the patient does not recover immediately or if an injury is present. Once consciousness is regained, observe the patient in a quiet area for a minimum of 15 minutes. Severe, life-threatening anaphylactic reactions following vaccination are rare, estimated at about one in a million doses. Anaphylactic or allergic reactions may be due either to the vaccine or a vaccine component and may be severe and life-threatening. The risk of an allergic reaction can be decreased by thorough screening for contraindications and precautions prior to vaccination. However, even with careful screening, reactions may occur. Staff should be familiar with the signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis because allergic reactions usually begin within a few minutes to a few hours following vaccine administration. Anaphylaxis requires rapid recognition and treatment to prevent progression to cardiovascular collapse. Signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis can include, but are not limited to, generalized hives, itching, erythema or redness, flushing, swollen lips, face, throat, 
tongue or uvula, shortness of breath or dyspnea, wheezing and bronchospasm, strider, hypoxemia, abdominal pain or cramping, vomiting, reduced blood pressure, syncope or fainting, collapse, hypotonia, and incontinence. Every clinic must have an emergency kit containing epinephrine, both auto-injectors and aqueous epinephrine and ampules, diphenhydramine, and supplies for administering medications including filter needles for drawing epinephrine from the glass ampules. The emergency kit should also contain child and adult blood pressure cuffs, a stethoscope, and pediatric and adult resuscitators. If a patient has symptoms or signs of anaphylaxis, assess their airway, breathing, circulation, and their appearance and level of consciousness. If symptoms are generalized, call 911 immediately. Place the patient in a recumbent position. Make sure their airway is clear and perform CPR if necessary. The first and most important therapy in anaphylaxis is epinephrine. There are no contraindications to epinephrine in the setting of anaphylaxis. Each emergency kit will have a pediatric and an adult auto-injector that may be used for rapid administration of the initial dose of epinephrine. Administer aqueous epinephrine 1 to 1,000 intramuscularly. The dose for epinephrine is 0 0.01 milliliters per kilogram per dose. If the weight is known, then dosing by weight is preferred. If the weight is not known or not readily available, a chart included with the standing orders has approximate doses for children based on age and weight. The maximum dose for children is 0 0.3 milliliters, and the maximum dose for adults and adolescents is 0 0.5 milliliters. Diphenhydramine may be administered by IM injection. The dose is 1 to 2 milligrams per kilo, with a maximum single dose of 50 milligrams. The patient should be monitored closely until EMS arrives. Perform CPR if necessary and maintain the airway. Keep the patient in a supine position, flat on their back, unless he or she is having breathing difficulty. If breathing is difficult, that patient's head may be elevated, provided blood pressure is adequate to prevent loss of consciousness. If the blood pressure is low, elevate the legs. Repeat epinephrine dose every five to 15 minutes or more frequently as necessary to control symptoms and maintain the blood pressure up to two times after the first dose for the treatment of anaphylaxis. Monitor and record all vital signs. Record medications administered, including the time, dosage, response, name of person who administered the medication, and other relevant clinical information. All patients showing signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis, regardless of severity, should be referred to an appropriate medical facility for treatment. If EMS is called and the patient is transported to an emergency facility, the clinic manager must complete the referral to emergency facility form in addition to the incident adverse event reporting form. So when should you complete an incident adverse event reporting form? Fill out the form for any adverse reaction, including things like lightheadedness, headache, or itching, any person who was vaccinated twice, participants with contraindications who receive vaccine, participants who received the wrong vaccine presentation, for example, LIIV instead of IIV or vice versa, mistaken identity of the participant, anyone who received the vaccine using another person's consent form, and document any incident or unusual occurrence. Please include a copy, not the original, of the consent form with the incident report. Please complete all reports on the day of the incident so the details are fresh in your mind. But don't feel as if you have to complete the report during the clinic. It's fine to return to your office to complete the incident report. If you do complete the incident report prior to the end of the vaccination clinic, you may submit the report with the consent forms to the immunization branch. If the report will not reach the immunization branch on the day of the incident, please fax the report to area code 808-586-8312.
Please be aware that the incident reports and forms may be read and reviewed by upper management and by agencies and individuals outside of the Department of Health. Please remember when documenting incidents, be thorough but, but succinct, be specific, be objective, and be professional. Here are some common errors that we see on the incident adverse event reporting forms. Missing information, such as date of birth and school name. In this example, the patient's blood pressure is very low and there's no documentation of repeat blood pressure checks or any explanation of the actions taken. The final disposition states, went home with mother without any documentation of improvement in the patient's condition. In this example, with Gary grade school, the patient moved during administration of IIV. If the student does not receive a full dose, the parent must be contacted before a second attempt at vaccination is made. This form is marked, parent contacted, no. In this situation, parents should have been contacted for permission prior to attempting a repeat dose. The action section includes steps taken to prevent recurrence, does not need to be completed. There's no action that could have prevented this incident. Now we will review the procedures for responding to bloodborne pathogen exposures. If a person is exposed to bloodborne pathogens at a school located influenza immunization clinic, treat the exposure site immediately. Wash needle sticks and cuts with soap and water. Flush lashes to the nose, mouth, or skin with water. Irrigate eyes with clean water, saline, or sterile irrigants, and report any bloodborne pathogen exposure to the clinic manager. Any person exposed to bloodborne pathogens at the school located clinic should immediately seek medical treatment. Contracted personnel should be referred to their employer. Military personnel should be referred to the Department of Defense. And public health nursing, nursing branch staff should be referred to the PHN branch. The clinic manager should record the circumstances and post-exposure management on the incident adverse event reporting form. The report should include the date and time of exposure, details of the procedure being performed, including where and how the exposure occurred. And if the exposure is related to a sharp device, include the type and brand of the device and how and when in the course of handling the device the exposure occurred. Include details of the exposure describing the type and amount of fluid or material and the severity of the exposure. Provide details about the exposure source, including the name and the parent or guardian's name if the student is under 18 years of age, address, and telephone number. List the exposed person's name, address, telephone number, hepatitis B vaccination dates, and vaccine response status. So in what situation should a parent be called? If the student has a consent form but states that he or she has already been vaccinated, contact the parent to confirm. If the student pulls away during administration and receives only a partial dose, contact the parent to ask if they would like you to attempt vaccination again. If you are unable to contact the parent in this situation, do not revaccinate. If questions are left blank on the consent form, you may attempt to call the parent. However, if the clinic is very busy, the clinic manager does not need to call in this situation. However, the student should not be vaccinated. If the student has contraindications, you may contact the parent to explain that the student will not be vaccinated. But again, if the clinic is busy, the clinic manager does not need to call in this situation. However, the student should not be vaccinated. You can contact the parent for uh, the date of the parent or guardian signature being missing. Parents should be contacted for any adverse event and any time a repeat dose is necessary. Persons with adverse events post-vaccination at a previous stop fluid school clinic will be listed on a green sheet which will be packed with the ICS forms. The list will include the names of persons who should not be vaccinated at a stop fluid school clinic and those who may only be vaccinated with a doctor's note. This concludes this portion of the training, and now Gail Ogawa will review the consent forms.
Thank you. So I'm going to be reviewing the Stop Fluid School Consent Forms. There are two types of student consent forms, one for the flu shot and the other for the flu nasal spray. Here is the student consent form for the flu shot. The areas circled in red must be completed. These include first and last name, date of birth, questions one, two, and three must be answered no, and the form must be signed and dated by the parent or legal guardian. This is the student consent form for the flu nasal spray. The required fields include first and last name, date of birth, questions one through eight must be answered no, and the form must be signed and dated by the parent or legal guardian. Staff have been instructed to notify the clinic manager if any of the mandatory fields on either form are left blank or if a screening question has been marked yes. Please be sure to review the screening of consent forms process with registration and vaccinator staff as part of the just-in-time training prior to the start of the clinic. These are the online versions of the student consent forms. They will most likely be printed on white paper. This may make them more difficult to distinguish from each other. The flu shot consent form has three questions and a syringe icon in the lower right corner of the form. The flu nasal spray consent form has eight questions and does not have an icon. This is an example of a completed flu shot consent form. Here are three common errors that are seen. First, the year entered in the date of birth field is obviously incorrect. Question three has been left blank. And though the vaccination has been documented on the form, there is also a reason that the flu shot was not given that has been selected. With both vaccination and declination information provided, we are not able to determine whether this child was vaccinated or not. This is an example of a completed flu nasal spray consent form. Here are three additional errors that are commonly seen. Based on the year of birth, you can determine that an adult has completed this consent form. Due to funding restrictions on the purchasing of vaccine for this program, no adult will be vaccinated at the Stop Fluid School Clinics. The parent or legal guardian has signed the form, but the signature is not dated. And the vaccinator ID number is missing. Here are a few reminders regarding consent forms. First, please check every form for completeness and accuracy. Be sure that all of the mandatory fields are completed. If the student has refused vaccination or is absent, please ensure that the date, site, and lot number sticker are not on the consent form. Also, because all of the consent forms will be scanned for archiving, please remove any sticky dots, staples, and or paper clips. Finally, please do not punch holes in the consent forms. Depending on the placement of these holes, critical information may inadvertently be removed. I will now turn the presentation over to Alicia to talk about staffing. Okay, I would like to provide you with general information about staffing and a review of clinic staffing forms and instructions related to staffing. First of all, how we determine the number of staff for each clinic depends on several factors, including the total number of participants, and that's based on a total number of consent forms collected per clinic, and the total number of clinic hours as per the clinic schedule and a standard minimum number of vaccinations that can be administered per hour, which was determined in a clinic flow study that was conducted in previous stop fluid school clinics. Now for Oahu clinics, a list providing the number of staff per clinic is posted on SharePoint at least one week prior to clinic start date. 
which you can review prior to each clinic. If you have any concerns, please contact your section rep. There are two separate and unique forms used for documentation of assigned clinic staff and attendants, and serve as a clinic sign-in sheet for each clinic. There is the ICS-211 form, registration staff clinic sign-in sheet, which includes line flow personnel, and the ICS-211V form for vaccinators only sign-in sheet, including clinic manager, managers and vaccine group supervisors. And both these forms will be provided on the day of the clinic and will be located uh, in the ICS packet. Before showing you an example of the two staffing forms, I wanted to review a few things about them. For Oahu Clinic specifically, both 211 and the 211V forms will have pre-populated columns on the form with information such as clinic name, date, and time, names of assigned staff, role, and affiliation. And on the 211 form for Oahu Clinics, it will list registration staff assigned to bring back supplies, and they are listed as SR1 and SR2, the SR1 being primary supplies return person, and the SR2 being the secondary or backup supplies return person. The 211V forms for vaccinators will be listing uh, clinic managers and vaccine group supervisors as well. <clears throat> the fill-in columns on these forms will be a section where uh, the assigned staff can verify by initially that they received just-in-time training and reviewed standing orders and uh, a space where they can enter their time in and time out. So on all the 211, 211V clinics sign-in sheets statewide, uh, clinic managers and vaccine group supervisors will need to complete specific attendance status information such as staff that are late or a no-show, or a staff that is a replacement for a no-show. And on the signing sheets, I'll show you where there are, you can abbreviate uh, and mark a staff as a no-show, which would be an N for no-show, or L for late, and R for replacement. And for a while clinic, sign-in sheets will also have a note section or a message to the clinic manager and vaccine group supervisor to confirm that additional staff or early staff requested was provided. For example, if an uh, RN was requested for the holding area, it, it will say extra RN for holding area. Or an RN one hour early will also be noted. Or if there was an extra registration staff requested, that will be included as well. Now this is an example of an ICS-211 clinic sign-in sheet for registration staff for Oahu Clinics with the pre-populated information. And at the top, you will see the clinic name and school ID and uh, the scheduled time and date. The pre-populated names of all the assigned vaccinators includes the clinic manager and uh, VDS. Oh, actually, this is the uh, registration form, so we'll review the SR1 and SR2 which are the assigned, the assigned uh, supplies return persons. And we have uh, the fill-in columns where we have uh, initial, it says initial for uh, verifying that I received just-in-time training, the area where staff enters time in and time out. And we have the attendance status area where markings will be made for a documenting staff that is late, no show, or replacement. We also have that note area where uh, in this example shows that one extra registration staff that was requested was included. Now you see that the affiliation for the staff is also included. You have ALTRES, MRC, and DOH. Now, this is an example of a ICS-211V form uh, for Oahu. Again, the, the section on top for vaccinators, uh, this form is populated, school ID and clinic date and time. Then we have the vaccinators listed as well as their role and affiliation. 
We have the attendance status again, where we are going to enter the information about their attendance status. And at the bottom, if I didn't mention before, there's a key that uh, you can refer to for the abbreviations for the attendance section. Now, there are changes, changes in assignments can occur, and they usually occur up until the morning of the clinic, and those changes will not be reflected on the sign-in sheet. So, you can refer to the published list of approved as stop with school personnel to verify eligibility of persons reporting to clinic whose name is not pre-populated on the sign-in sheets. And this list is located in the Go Kit with the ICS packet. Please note that the approved registration staff is going to be listed first by names of vaccinators, excuse me, first by names of registration, then followed by names of vaccinators that are approved. And both lists are in alpha order. Now, this sign-in sheet demonstrates how to document when there are last-minute changes that we just discussed. And, uh, that are not reflected on the pre-populated sign-in sheet. So in the, for this example, we have uh, the pre-populated names here. Uh, there are Marilyn Manson and Marianne Gomez that are, are listed as assigned staff but are crossed off. And then we have the names Lindy Lou and, and Harry Potter are added by the uh, VGS or the clinic managers and they've listed their affiliation. And these names are, are replacements for the two that were uh, not attending the clinic because they were not they were reassigned. So, in summary, uh, you cross out the names of those that are not assigned to the clinic after all, and then you add the newly assigned staff. This is an example of a documentation of a no-show and replacement staff. So we have here uh, an NS for no-show, where Brittany Spears uh, does not show up. And then Kate, Katy Perry, who's uh, listed here and added as an altruist replacement, is noted as RP for replacement. Notice that Katy Perry's clinic time in is after the required time. So, and she would be considered as late if it were not for being marked as a replacement. So that marking is very important. This is an example of documentation of a staff who is late to a clinic. And on this form, Mary Ann Castro's check-in time is 8.10. Clearly, uh, she's late, so an L is listed and marked as, as for us to uh, confirm that she was late to the clinic. Now, if you need assistance, uh, you can call uh, using the Stop List School Telephone Triage List for for uh, for assistance, and then contact Altrus directly if you have Altrus staff that are late or no show, and also to request replacement for that late or no show person. You can contact the immunization branch, um, myself or Kit, if a volunteer staff are late or no show, and for. Clinic role reassignments, if you need to change uh, registration staff to a uh, vaccinator, then you must call us. And then there might be other uh, requests that you uh, need to refer to us for approval. Okay, so late staff, no-shows and partners, staff contributions will be tracked so this personal check-in information is very important. The sign-in time and sign-out time is very important as well. Ensure that all clinic staff write that in. Uh, if the information uh, is not there, then we will be calling you to uh, verify. So again, it's very important for our clinic staff to sign in as well as sign out. 
Well, this is the personnel action reporting form. And the form is to uh, document any incidences or actions regarding staffing. Uh, so when should you fill out this personnel reporting form? So when any action, performance, or attitude of a clinic personnel that requires resolution by upper management, that's when you would re fill one of these out. And examples of reportable personnel issues are um, issues that ca may cause safety, um, interfere with safety, and threaten the safety of students and or the staff. Insubordination or interferes with the efficiency of the clinics and attitude issues, which undermines the authority of the clinic managers and overall the safety of the clinic. The form is to be completed by the clinic manager or the vaccine group supervisor, and if completed by the vaccine group supervisor, it must be reviewed by the clinic manager. And Complete this form as soon as possible while information is fresh in your mind. Um, and that, that's, that's something that will help you. So, uh, and you will submit it on the day of or as soon as you've completed it. Now, reports and forms may be read and reviewed by agencies and individuals outside of the department. So. Please, it's very important that when you're documenting personnel action uh, issues, be very specific, detailed, but succinct, and be objective and professional as well. This concludes the section on staffing, and I will send it off. Thanks so much, Alicia. Now, everyone watching this webinar, be sure to document your completion of this training on the sign-in sheet. If you have questions regarding the content of this training, please contact the immunization branch at 808-586-8300 if you're located on Oahu, or if you're located on the neighbor islands, you can dial 1-800-933-4832 or email schoolflu.helpdesk at doh.hawaii.gov. Thank you for watching this webinar. Your work as clinic managers is invaluable and much appreciated. Thank you for supporting the Stop Flu at School vaccination program.